Thank you for coming on time. Um, before we start, we're going to start with a, with a time of worship, so do grab a seat, and I'll hand the time to Sam. Well, good morning, everyone. Can we stand together? Um, yeah, well done for making it on time. Um, so, yeah, today's a very special Sunday. We have uh, Josh Eck. Uh, with us, this is our first proper week here. So, uh, should we should we give him a round of applause? Um, he'll be preaching later on, so it's gonna be good. It's gonna be a good morning. Um, you know, it's good when we have two pastors in in really nice shirts. Um, so, yeah, let's worship together. Um, it's it's such a joy to to be able to gather together as as one church and to lift up the name of Jesus. Uh, we know that. Um, we're here to celebrate what God has done in our lives. So regardless of how we feel, regardless of what has happened um, this week, should we just come to the presence of God right now and, and just worship Him? Um, let's lift our eyes onto the Lord and um, yeah, give Him the praise that He deserves. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Lift up our voice. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. Only. Pray. Give life, you are love, you bring life to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that. Praise. It's a 
of it all. Oh, the earth. put our trust in you this morning, Lord. You know that um, even though our life uh, goes up and down, Lord, your grace never changes. Your love is constant. In Psalms 18, it says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliver, deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Thank you that you are our rock and our refuge, that we can put our trust in you. So as we continue to worship, Lord, we just put our full faith in you this morning. We declare that you are Lord above it all. You alone. 
seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high
morning, our greatest desire is just to worship you, Lord, for who you are. So as, as we continue with our service, as uh, Josh preaches, Lord, would you just soften our hearts? Would you enable us to be tender and be able to listen to you this morning, Lord? We want more of you. We want to know who you are, Lord. We hunger and thirst for that. So we thank you that um, we're able to gather here this morning. Lord, we thank you that in your name there is there is joy strength. Um, so in all these things, we lift you up, Lord, and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Please feel free to take a seat. Amen. Welcome to BCC. Would you turn to the person around you and say, it's good to see you here this morning. I've waited the whole week just to sit beside you. And if you're joining us um, online, it's great to have you with us as well. Alright, so this is just the evacuation plan. For those of you who are here for the very first time, we have got four exits, so just run that way. I'm going to click next. Right, there will be no um, Explorer videos today, but Explorers, you're free to go upstairs now. We've got a party plan for you. Ooh. But if you are here for the very first time, we've got three different classes that seek to minister to your children from as young as three years old to 11 years old. So if you've got children between this age, um, do send them to our explorers. All right. There you go. So we've got little to all the way to grand explorers, three years old to 11 years old. So if you've got kids that age, do send them to our explorers groups. As the children make their way to their party upstairs, we've got some news and notices that I would like to bring you through. So here's what's coming up next in our church for the month of July and August. We've got some really interesting speakers, all the way from Josh Eck to my dentist, Jason Ho. Um, so do save the dates and, uh, and, and bring a friend. All right, so um, this is just a reminder. We're taking a break uh, next week. So that is the 23rd of July and the 6th and the 13th of... The of just, just the evening service, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, morning, the morning service will continue as usual. No interruption there. All right. Uh, next week, because we're taking a break for the evening service, we're having a special Oikos service as well to celebrate the end of the Explorer year. So do um, join us. And right after the morning service, we're going to have a church picnic. And that will be at Park Central uh, Sunset Park. So bring your own um, snacks and uh, drinks and join us in the picnic. We'll, we'll leave from the church together. Uh, so do, do remember to, to join us. All right. So and if you're wondering how different is the evening service, well, this is your chance to find out. Once a month, we have this encounter PM where we have some prayer and praise. And, and this time, we'll have some sharing as well from the people who have um, attended Fat Camp. So do save the date and come and join us for uh, one of the evening service. Now, we've uh, announced this back in May. Uh, if you sign your kids up for the Vacation Bible School, um, so if you sign up and paid, uh, do remember that it is happening from the 31st of July um, to the 4th of August. So if you submitted your registration and made payment as well. If you've got any questions, do reach out to Mei Chan via email address. Via email, sorry, email address. And if you are interested in joining our team, um, we're always looking for people to join us. So do speak to one of us and we can uh, get you sorted. Um, this is something that we've introduced last week. So if you're not here last week, we have got um, community, uh, we've got a, a WhatsApp community set up. So if you would like more information, I'm not going to go through all the slides, but here is the QR code that you can scan uh, and join us that way. If you've got any questions regarding um, this, you can always just uh, come speak to myself or Bert after the service. All right, uh, we've come to the time of giving. Before I ask the ushers to uh, come forward, I would just like to pray for the offering. Uh, the offering time is um, a time for us as Christians to uh, worship God and uh, give back through our giving. So if you 
would like to just close your eyes and bow your heads as I pray for the offering. Father God, we just want to thank you for today. And we just want to thank you that it is you, God, who first gave your one and only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And so it is in our new nature to give. And as we give this day, we pray that you will just remind us, God, that we are owners of nothing, but mere stewards of yours placed on this earth. So as we give this day, we pray that you will bless the leaders of BCC to use these funds wisely for the furtherance and expansion of your kingdom. We thank you, God. We thank you for all the gifts, talents, and abilities that you place in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to invite the um, ushers to come up with the giving bags. So you can give uh, physically um, through the giving bags or you can scan the QR code that will bring you to our website where you'll be able to get the uh, church details, our bank details, or you could set up um, a direct debit. And if you are a UK taxpayer, do remember to sign up um, for the tax reliefs. Tax reliefs? Yeah. Give aid. <laughs> Right, before I hand the time back to Josh, who's going to come up, I'm going to invite someone that needs no introduction, Christabel, to pray for the NHS. Over to you, Christabel. I'm just going to pray for the NHS. <laughs> um, Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for our national health um, s s care system that we have here. Um, but God, it's also one that's struggling and um, with longer waking times and um, unsafe staffing. God, I just pray that you would um, make a way as we continue to care for um, patients and their families. God, we pray especially for the, the current strikes that are happening right now and also the upcoming consultant strikes as well. Pray um, for patient safety, um, but pray that they will also bring about um, some good talks between the um, health sectors and those in charge to be able to bring about um, a, a good way to move forward as staff um, want to care for their patients well, but also struggle with lack of staff and lack of um, just um, facilities and things like that. So God, I just pray that you would bring about change. Um, but we do thank you for the healthcare system that we have here. And that is just a real joy to be able to care for those um, when they are sick and when they are um, unwell. But pray that you'd be able to help us to do that in a way that is safe. And um, yeah, that you would just provide a way. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Oh, man, this is so exciting. Um, I'm so happy to be here and so happy that I get to call it today like my, my first day, uh, not in office, in the office, I guess. This is now like my, my office. So um, welcome to my office and my, and my workplace. Um, no, I'm so happy. So, so happy. Like it's been, I think, what, three months since I was last here, something around, around that kind of time. And the, the last time I was up here was my interview by all of you. And since then, you have uh, very, very generously um, accepted me uh, into, uh, into this community. And so for me to, to be able to stand here today and, and be able to uh, give, I guess, my, my inaugural preach, I guess, in, in, in that sense, um, is, is just for, for me a sign of God's, God's grace um, in, in, in my life. And I hope that over the next weeks, months, hopefully years um, as well, that I'll get to really um, meet all of you and get to know, know all of you as well. I, I'm really, really looking forward to, to really settling into, into this community. There's a lot of you. I've never actually been a church pastor before. All of my preaching has been itinerant. All of my work has been like at a much wider scale rather than just located in, in, in one city. So this is a very, very new environment, a very new context, a um, very new mode of work uh, and ministry for me as well. So please teach me as well. I've got so much to learn um, from, from all of you, from your existing leaders who are doing a fantastic job. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, I presume, um, as well. And I hope to be able to, uh, to carry on that tradition of God's grace um, as well. So please do come find me and come talk to me um, as you have coffees and teas afterwards as well. Give me time as well. There's a lot of people to know. And I am terrible with names. So forgive me now. I'll just ask for forgiveness now. If I, if I can't remember names, forgive me. But I do hope that as we get to know each other, um, that that's going to change. Having said that, that that's really fitting for um, our sermon today. Um, uh, we are, we, I get to say that now, not you are starting a new series. We are starting uh, a new series for the next, I think, seven to eight weeks or, or thereabouts. And, and we're calling it the Blessing Series. 
And it's this idea of, as we look at this year-long theme of a new heart, as we look at what is God's heart for us and for the world, what is the way that we see God change people's hearts through the Bible as well. As God is changing our hearts, how does that change the way that we live? In particular, how does that change the way that we bless others around us, in the world, our families, our workplaces, and so on? And so for the next seven, eight weeks, seven, eight weeks we'll, we'll be looking at these various different ways that we can become a blessing into other people's lives. As God changes our hearts, as we start to cultivate that Christ-like character, that Christ-like grace inside of our hearts, how does that actually come out in context, in the reality of the relationships that we have with one another? And we're starting with this one today, the blessing of hospitality. You guys have given me an incredible welcome. You've been incredibly hospitable as I've come here. So I hope to be able to reflect some of those thoughts um, back to us uh, as we consider this series of, of blessing uh, within one another. Before I get into that, though, can I pray for us once more? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your generosity in our lives. We thank you for your grace in our lives and in our community. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, everything you are doing for us, and everything that you will do for us, Lord God. We thank you for your welcome uh, of us into your household, into your family. And we pray that you help our hearts to be shaped towards and extending that love and generosity out to us as well. Help us to glean some wisdom and to take some encouragement and conv conviction from Scripture this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 15, verses 5 to 7. Hopefully this works. Yay, it does. Cool. Right, there it says this. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So Paul is encouraging his Roman congregation to consider this idea that Christ himself has welcomed us. Christ's love, God's acceptance, it, it is an extension of hospitality that the Father gives to his people. And as Christ has welcomed you, therefore go and welcome others. Often when we talk about hospitality, it feels like we're the ones taking initiative. But what Paul is telling us right off the bat here is that no, 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 it, you have been welcomed already. You are part of the household. You now have the resources, the skills, the context, the ability, the heart to now extend that welcome to others for the glory of God. And we've got to start with that. We've got to consider this idea that blessing, whether that's through hospitality or through anything, any other resource of heart or finances or whatever it is of time, emotion, those things come out of a response, not come in out of an initiative. The moment we think about it as an initiative, it's our work, we're going to struggle. We're going to doubt. We're going to be afraid. We're going to find it difficult to extend that grace and goodness. But if we remember, like the way Paul reminds us, that actually, no, 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 this is a response out of God's initiative that suddenly makes things much much easier i try and think about it in this kind of way now i've realized that i have just joined a chinese church and so i'm going to be using lots of chinese analogies particularly of which is food if you've heard me preach in other places i probably use food analogies about 90 percent of the time in my analogy so i hope you like food i hope you like asian food in particular the first analogy I'm going to use is this idea of not so much food in particular, but the restaurant context. Who here has ever fought for the bill before or witnessed a fight for the bill? And so what most of us probably have, a few hands are going up, lots of, lots of heads are, are, are nodding around. We come from a, a, a cultural context where you, you want to honor the other person by paying for the, for the meal. Or you've seen your parents do it. You've seen your friends do it. It's one way that we try to answer. I kind of feel like what, what Paul is reminding us is that Christ has already gone to pay for the bill. Right? The meal's finished, and everyone's like looking at each other. But Jesus has already done that clever thing where he's gone up. He's, he said, okay, I'm, I'm going to the bathroom quickly. But rather than going to the bathroom, well, he goes to the bathroom. But then on his way back, he goes to the cashier desk and pays for the meal. And then he gets back. And then you realize, oh, 
It's already done. Someone has already taken the initiative to pay for this. And so the question becomes, okay, right, how does my heart respond to that? And then that's where things get interesting. Because our hearts can respond to hospitality and our hearts can extend hospitality in ways that at face value can seem quite mundane, quite, quite simple. It's just about extending and receiving hospitality. But because, particularly for our culture, we're so embedded in this idea of showing honor, of extending hospitality, that things can sometimes get a little bit context. But what we can first see from this passage is how hospitality is one of the ways that we as Christians can regulate our hearts. By that, I mean not that it keeps our biological heart pumping at a proper pace, but kind of like a pacemaker, learning to extend hospitality regularly somehow regulates the condition of our hearts to carry on being able to extend grace. By extending hospitality, we repeat this idea, this concept that God has welcomed us and so now we welcome other people. And every time we welcome someone else, we remind ourselves that we've already been welcomed. And every time that happens again, we remind ourselves that God has welcomed us. Do you see where I'm going with this? Extending hospitality is one of the most fundamental ways that we can regulate our heart's condition. And so as simple and as basic as something like hospitality sounds, it's actually quite fundamental because through showing hospitality, we condition ourselves to a point where we remember that I can give of my most fundamental resources, my meal, my time, my energy, my presence, and out of giving of those simplest of things that we are in possession of, we prepare ourselves to extend a deeper grace of empathy, of sympathy, of compassion, of deeper generosity when those occasions arise. But if we don't practice those simple steps of sharing our most basic resources, it's gonna become much, much harder for us to be able to extend those deeper graces when those opportunities arise. And so hospitality becomes one of the ways that we can fundamentally regulate our heart's condition. But like I said, there is a difference though between hospitality that is born and shown and extended out of a grace, out of a gift, and hospitality that might have a different kind of edge to it. The kind of hospitality that says, oh, let me serve you in the hope that I might get something back out of it later on. And this is where things can get quite complex. I want to start off right back and say that Christ-like hospitality is grace that is given freely. It is grace that is not born out of a hope of reciprocation. Uh, sorry, it is born out. Sorry, it is born out of the hope of reciprocation, but not the expectation of it. I'll say that part again. Christ-like hospitality is born out of a hope of reciprocation, but not the expectation of it. Whilst cultural hospitality is given as a measured cost and expects a return in kind at some point in the future. And you start to see there's a nuance there. There is a difference in where the heart's condition is as we show hospitality. So particularly for us as this morning, as we're looking at this idea of showing, showing hospitality, of blessing other people with hospitality, um, what else does the Bible have to say about it? Well, it turns out that there are only four times in the New Testament when this word hospitality is actually used in the New Testament. I'm going to just draw three points from those four uh, occasions that I think help us to understand what does Christ-like hospitality look like in particular against this idea of cultural hospitality? The first point, uh, I'm going to take it from Romans chapter 12 and 1 Peter chapter 4. They are on the screen uh, if you want to follow through. Let me read those for us first. Romans chapter 12. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And then first, chapter 4, verses 8 to 9. Above all, keep loving 
one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Interesting, isn't it? That two out of these four occasions where we see the word hospitality, it is directly linked to this other word, love, in here. Hospitality has to be born out of love. It is not born out of a desire to invest or out of a desire to see, an, see a return and expectation. Let love be genuine. Keep loving one another. And one of the immediate ways that we see, we, how we see that happens is by showing hospitality. It even clarifies what that looks like as well. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now, is that kind of like the paying for the bill, kind of outdoing each other, like challenging each other to be able to show more honor? There's a part of that, I think. There's a part of it where as we want to bless other people, we desire to out-bless them. And that's a good thing. It is good that our, our, our hearts are our corporate economy, our corporate society, our life as a family operates in this mode where we are constantly looking for ways to serve and honor each other, to see the other person as greater than us and to serve them out of that position, out of that awareness, out of that conviction. Outdoing, outdoing, uh, outdoing each other in honor for each other, out of love for them, can be done through hospitality. First Peter qualifies it even more. Show hospitality to one, one another without grumbling. Because it's also possible to serve one another in ways that are done through gritted teeth as well. Fine, I'll pay for the bill. Even though I paid for the bill last time, I'll pay for it again. But Paul warns us against that kind of, that kind of hospitality. He's showing us that it, this, this stuff happens. It is entirely possible for us to serve in a way that is not born out of love, but it is born out of a heart that is holding on to something that is not willing to give freely, that desires something in return. But Paul says that true loving hospitality, true loving gracious service is done without a heart that grumbles. About seven, eight years ago, um, uh, the charity that I was with, um, we all went on this big staff trip um, out to Turkey. It was basically a Holy Land trip. So we visited the, uh, the seven churches in Turkey, and, like the, the existing ruins and the sites of those, of those places. Um, and it was like a typical like Chinese tour bus kind of routine. And it was like seven, 60 of us all on a bus driving from Smyrna, off to Tiotar, or whatever, all these different other places. And like halfway through, through, through this trip, our, our tour guide um, helped us stop off um, at this place that was uh, selling Turkish carpets. And if you know anything about Turkish carpets, they're actually incredibly detailed. They are very, very well done, very, very soft, um, and very, very expensive. Um, so we were dropped off at this Turkish carpet, car, car, Turkish carpet, oh man, that's a mouthful, <laughs> Turkish carpet place. Um, halfway through, through our trip in between these two different churches. Well, okay, right, well, what are we doing here? We were dropped off. Like, we were ushered, then very warmly ushered into this large room, and we were sat on this circle of chairs all around the wall. And in front of us were, was this massive selection of large, fine Turkish rugs and carpets. We were then served these wonderful Turkish teas as, as, as complimentary. We were then invited to take our shoes off to walk around on these carpets and to get a feel for how comfortable they were. I don't know if we were the first busload of people to walk around on those carpets, but it certainly felt very nice as we were walking around. And so like, we, please tell us which ones you want. And us being cool furnishings that, the, that these people had painstakingly put together, I presume. It wasn't, it, it might have been a machine, I don't know. I like to think it was like this whole warehouse of Turkish children, no, not children, but like the people like <laughs> putting this stuff together. And then we left, and we had just not returned that hospitality. So there was a part of me that's been like, oh, is this good? Like, shouldn't we have done something and left something? But then when I thought back to, wait, well, no, no, we were, we were led into this. Like, we were dropped off, we were... We were given all these things. What was their hope out of that interaction? Were they hoping to get 30 plus sales of these really, really nice carpets in the end? Now, I won't 
try to get into the heads too deeply about what was going on with um, those people. But you can see how in some circumstances, hospitality can, can be used in such a way where you're, you're using it to invest and expect a return, rather than using it as simply as a way of giving to someone else for their blessing. But Scripture tells us, let love be genuine. Don't do it through grumbling. Allow your hearts to show hospitality to one another that honors the other person, doesn't try to exploit them in any kind of way. Oh, well, it, that, wasn't, this, that wasn't it. But that now brings you into what the visual context might have looked like. Okay. Christ-like hospitality is genuine. Cultural hospitality expects something, demands something in return. Christ-like hospitality is genuine in its loving expression. Secondly, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, let a widow be enrolled for the church to then pay for their support. So the church would provide the food, the church would care for their, for their welfare, and they would have had these registers of people, especially widows, not just in terms of their character, but especially in terms of their consistency. For a widow to reach that age and to have the kind of reputation where she has consistently shown hospitality, consistently looked after the needs of the poor and the afflicted in the community, and consistently been able to raise a family that has contributed to society and to the church, uh, church community as well, tells me that when Paul specifically mentioned, mentions this word hospitality here, what we're seeing, what this image that we're given is someone that is persistent in their hospitality. Not someone that just extends generosity and welcome once to you and then that's it, I've done my job, you go somewhere else now. This is someone that over a long, long time, repeatedly, consistently, without failure, will, is willing to welcome people into her home. See, food, I told you, it's coming up. Have you had lunch yet? Probably not. How's breakfast? My mum's really, really good. My, my parents are really, really good um, at, at this. Uh, I grew up in a takeaway family. So uh, we had a typical, I had a typical kind of upbringing where the shop, the takeaway was downstairs and we lived upstairs. Um, it meant that our kitchen was an entire floor of our house. Um, but it was fantastic. It meant that my parents, my, my dad is, is a fantastic um, cook. He taught most of the people, most of the takeaway owners in Portsmouth how to cook um, the food as well. Um, and in terms of hospitality, my mum is fantastic at this. Ever since I was a kid, I just remember pe people being, being invited back to our house every weekend. I grew up in a Christian household, and so every Sunday after church, most Sundays, um, someone would end up being invited over. And it tended to be like the students that were studying um, in Portsmouth, where, where I grew up. Right? These young people who were studying hard, who didn't have their own families or their their, or didn't have their own resources to be able to uh, enjoy stuff like this um, at home, my parents would be very generous in extending a welcome um, to them. Even to this day, I still hear reports of how when people went to Portsmouth to study or to work, they, they, they always report back to me just how loving and kind my parents were. And it's that kind of testimony. It's that idea where hospitality, you only you only realize it when it's persistent, when it's consistent. You can go have a meal at someone's house one time, and you might remember that one time, but it doesn't necessarily create a perception, an image that this person is full of grace and generosity. It requires that persistence, that consistence of extension of welcome in order to create this sense of Christ-like hospitality, not just cultural hospitality. Routines require practice. If we're going to live out this idea of showing hospitality, it's something that we've got to realize is not just about this coming weekend that we've got people coming over. It's about, okay, how do I show it this weekend and then the next weekend and the next time I've got an opportunity to do it. As we do that, it goes back again into that idea of how do we regulate the condition of our hearts to extend grace. 
If we don't condition it through regularity, we're not going to maintain that heart status. True hospitality will be consistent, not expectant. And finally, Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 3. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. I can just about see that. More food analogies. Who's seen this before? Some of you probably have. This, this started circulating a few years back. Uh, it is the hierarchy of biscuits. Uh, if you know anything about British culture, this is a highly contested subject and issue for debate in our society. Um, if, you don't, if you aren't aware of this context, this is going to sound incredibly weird to you, but let me educate you in our cultural uh, distinctives. Uh, what we see here is on the bottom, this is basically a selection of different biscuits and the kind of people or the type of person that, that are worthy of that, that biscuit quality. So the bottom tier, you've got like your nice biscuits, your rich teas. It, say, it even says regular congregation. That's you guys. You only deserve these pink wafer biscuits, malted milks to dunk in your tea. They have the lowest integrity in dunk dunk strength. I think someone's done videos on this as well. And then right at the top, you have this gold foil wrapped double chocolate deluxe biscuit. It is high quality, reserved only for the likes of visiting dignitaries, bishops. If the queen were to ever visit here, I hope we have, sorry, not queen, the king were to visit here, I hope, and the queen, I hope we have a stash of gold foil wrapped double chocolate deluxes somewhere hidden away in the shelf. We're a Chinese church, so we probably have a stash of these somewhere. I've not found them yet. I will tell you when I find them as I rummage through, through everywhere. We have somehow turned this into a meme, into a, into a thing. There is a hierarchy of biscuits, and we reserve the best for the best. People of lower status deserve lower quality biscuits. People of higher status deserve these precious resources that we possess. What would happen if, I wish I had it. Oh, this would have been a great analogy. What would happen if I had brought, or we as a church had brought a whole chest load of gold foil wrapped double chocolate deluxe biscuits for all of us to enjoy here. Knowing that this is the current societal standard for who is worthy of that gift. Would you, in receiving that gift, feel that somehow your treatment, your status in this place, your relationship to those around you had changed somehow? I know I would. Like if I was given a gold, uh, like a foil wrapped biscuit over like a rich tea from a, from a, from a half opened packet that has been sat there for, for weeks already. Like, oh, this, this person cares for me. This person is welcoming. This person wants to give me. This person is somehow changing the original social boundaries and rules that, ex that I thought existed. And through the simple act of showing me this generous hospitality has changed the dynamic between me and them. Now, I know I'm using a fairly funny analogy here, but I think there's something profound in how powerful hospitality can be in the way that it not only breaks down social norms, it breaks down these social barriers, but it actually transforms relationships. How can we learn to show hospitality in a way that actually transforms the relationships that exist between us? Something as simple as giving something some, giving someone something that is seen as reserved, something that is seen as rich, something that is seen as worthy, to use those things to change and transform the relationships that exist between me and someone else. Especially for those who are outside of our immediate social circles, those who are perhaps on the fringes of society, how can we use hospitality in a way that is transformational? Not just as a simple, fundamental way of extending grace, but as this powerful device that we can use to reshape 
what we as a Christ-following society and community look like and operate like. And I think this is what makes so, uh, hospitality so important because it is so powerful in that way. Sharing a meal can have the effect of bridging a gap and extending grace that is unexpected and can lead to someone encountering the love of Christ through your generosity. Christ-like hospitality in its third marker is transforming. So I think there's a few panels there of how we can understand this difference between Christ-like hospitality and cultural hospitality. It's born out of love, it is consistent, and it is transforming. And that's how we can, in some sense, start to assess, okay, what's my heart condition as I deploy this gift of hospitality to others? But before we close, I want to explore one more aspect of hospitality. And that's not the idea of extending hospitality, but the idea of receiving and accepting hospitality. Because we can spend all day talking about like, hey, what are different ways, what are different methods, what opportunities do we have to extend hospitality to each other. But I think perhaps in some sense, an even, not even more, but a very different but important marker of our heart's condition is how well do we accept hospitality? This simple, fundamental extension of grace that is offered to us as well. How do our hearts receive that grace? And can that test tell us something about our heart's condition? A few years back, I was with a church in London, and um, they had a, not a big youth group, maybe like 20 youths or so, and um, during the summer, uh, when we weren't running the youth group, well, as in, as I feel like, like our final youth group session of the year, of, of the academic year or something like that, we brought them all out to a, to a nearby park, and we played um, Ultimate Frisbee. Um, if you know this game, it's basically like two teams, one on each side, and then you throw the Frisbee, and kind of like rugby or American football, if you get your Frisbee into the end zone, then you score a point. After two 10-minute halves of this ultimate Frisbee game, all 20 youths were completely exhausted. They were clearly not very, these were Asian kids. They were very, very smart, but not very fit uh, at all. So after 20 minutes of, 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 of exertion, they, they were done, and they were like lying on the grass, and, and they were done. So, so me and a few of the other leaders, we, we, we knew that there was a Sainsbury's nearby. So we, we walked the five minutes, and we, we went there, and we thought, okay, what should we get? Oh, it's, it's warm outside. They're exhausted. Let's get them some ice cream. So we walked down to the frozen section, Bought a few packs of ice lollies and ice cream, and then walked to the tills. And as we were paying for it, I decided, well, this is not going to cost very much. It's like, what, 10, 15 pounds for all of these different uh, ice lollies? I, I can just pay for it. And as I was paying for it, one of my other leaders was saying, no, Josh, you can't pay for all of it. We have to share this cost together. Now, my tone actually doesn't quite give away exactly how much force was being thrown at me through this person's words. They were borderline angry that I was about to pay for all of it and wasn't asking for anything back from the other leaders. They were adamant that they needed to somehow contribute to this gift that we were giving to, to the youths. To the point where actually on our way on our way walking back, it got quite awkward. Like people didn't know what to say. The the other two leaders were just like standing behind and like no one needed to talk. And then, and then I was able to like uh, as we were handing them out, I, I got to the other just to chat to this other leader and say, Hey, what, what's going on? What? And you could see that this person found it difficult to simply be able to accept this gift. This this small, small gift of being able to take on this, this, this ice lolly, this small moment of refreshment, they found it difficult. They were angry that they weren't allowed to somehow contribute back to this gift. And in some sense, I think when it comes to something as fundamental, but also something as concrete as hospitality, it can sometimes reveal to us this repulsion that we might feel about being indebted to someone else. Sometimes being extended hospitality can feel like an imposition of honor that we feel like we then have to balance out through either reciprocation or through a rejection of it. And so 
knowing how to accept hospitality well, I think becomes one of the markers, one of the ways that we can understand, measure for ourselves, how well, how ready am I to extend hospitality? Because if I've not learned how to receive grace, to receive God's love, to receive Christ's goodness and his offer of welcome and hospitality into my life in the first place, if I can't receive his heart in the first place, where am I going to have the resources to extend that love and generosity in its genuine, consistent, transforming nature to others if I don't have the resources for it? And so I think if we're going to learn to extend hospitality well, we first have to learn how to receive hospitality well. Receiving hospitality well, I think, is the catalyst to the process of extending Christ-like hospitality. And it has to be done out of heart that then is grateful for that reception, for having received that grace. Remember that passage right at the beginning. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. Do I have it? Yeah, I do. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. If we don't learn to accept hospitality, then in that same kind of manner where extending hospitality transforms my relationship to someone else, rejecting hospitality, rejecting the grace of God also changes that relationship, but in the way where it pushes my host away from me. It pushes my benefactor away from me. If I try to extend hospitality and it is rejected, it actually pushes me away from the person I'm trying to bless. And so for us, one of the ways that we can also regulate our hearts is by learning how to receive and welcome in welcome. Is that a phrase? I'm going to make it a phrase. How do we learn to welcome, welcome in ways that allow our hearts to learn to be okay? And not just learn to be okay, but to find gratitude and joy out of receiving, out of receiving hospitality so that out of that place of being full, we then have the resources to be able to give generously. Only a heart that has already accepted grace and generosity can have the fullness to show grace and generosity generosity to others. If showing hospitality is an act of extending grace, then learning to accept hospitality with gratitude is the catalyst to that act. So there are, I think there's a few thoughts there for us. There are these different ways that we can measure the nature, the content of our hospitality. Is it being born out of a desire to bless or is it being born out of a desire to receive at someone's point in the future? Is our hospitality Genuine, is it consistent, and is it transforming? And if that sounds difficult, maybe our first practice, your first practice, isn't to find the next opportunity to extend it, but to firstly learn how to receive it. As opportunities arrive, as invitations are given to you to share a meal, to share someone's home, to share time with someone else, can you use that moment not to learn how to give, but to learn how to receive well? And then out of that, to then be able to give to others. So as you learn to love the Lord with all of your heart, may you first realize how much he already loves you. And may you then, out of that abundance, allow Christ's love to change the relationships around you through your welcome of others. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much of your welcome for us, for the way that you have so generously, so lavishly, and so graciously extended your welcome to us. For each one of us, for us as a church, Lord God, you have loved us with a love that is far deeper than we can ever give back to you. And so, Father, may your spirit help us to be grateful for our hearts to be soft to your love for us, for your, to your welcome of us, Lord God. And as we receive your grace, may that give us every conviction, every encouragement, and every resource that we already have to then extend that welcome to others. Help us in this matter. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
response is, are we, we're going to come to a time of response, so shall we stand together and uh, we'll enter into a time of worship. spend some time with God and, and let's just long for him. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless to this I hold 
to this I hope my hope is only Jesus for my life is wholly bound to His oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. to live out our faith, would you just show us, Lord, how to 
extend the Christ-like hospitality, a hospitality where uh, we don't look for anything in, re in return uh, because it's an extension of your grace, Lord, and it, it makes it, it's an extension of um, the salvation and the love that you've shown to us in the first place. So, Lord, show us to love um, because first you loved us. So we thank you, and, and would you just guide us by your Holy Spirit this week to be your hands, to be your feet. Lord, we love you. Would we continue to draw near to you, Lord? And we thank you that we are um, just your children. Uh, we're able to hear your voice. Uh, so we thank you, Lord. And in all these things, uh, we lift up your name. We give you all the praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah, feel free to take a seat. We have a